European scientists, personally acquainted with Hitler's despotic rule, were fearful of the rising Nazi tide. Famous scientists like Fermi, Einstein, Frisch, and Teller fled to America to escape Hitler's racial persecution. These foreign-born scientists were to play vital roles in the drama that would unfold in a little town in the Jemez Mountains of New Mexico. By 1939, the principle of nuclear fission was known throughout the scientific world. Would Hitler use this knowledge to build a fission bomb? The atomic bomb might already be within reach of the German war machine. Three Hungarian physicists, Leo Szilard, Eugene Wigner, and Edward Teller, called upon Albert Einstein to assist in drafting a letter to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, urging governmental support of fission research. Some recent work by E. Fermi and L. Szilard leads me to expect that the element uranium may be turned into a new source of energy. This new phenomenon would lead to the construction of bombs. A single bomb of this type might well destroy a whole port with some of the surrounding territory. I understand that Germany has actually stopped the sale of uranium from the Czechoslovakian mines. That she should have taken such early action might perhaps be understood on the ground that the son of the German Undersecretary of State, von Weizsäcker, is attached to the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin. While political wheels turned, Foreign-born and American scientists in many American universities continued their atomic research. In the heart of Chicago, beneath the west stands of the abandoned football stadium called Stag Field, Enrico Fermi and his scientific colleagues made history. Within a pile of graphite bricks and some uranium, assembled on the squash court under the stadium, theory became reality, and humanity unknowingly slipped into a new era. Fermi's successful chain reaction and Frisch and Pyle's ideas on neutron bombardment changed everything. A compelling report from a British research committee caused an immediate response among military leaders. The report made it clear a fission bomb was possible. If the British had achieved so much, perhaps the Germans had too. The United States government realized fission research must be intensified. President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill decided to consolidate their research efforts in the United States under the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. General Leslie Groves, a burly, imposing West Pointer, a ramrod and driver of men, was chosen to head the Manhattan Project. The civilian leader chosen to head the scientific team was completely different from Groves. Robert Oppenheimer, renowned for his research into the structure of the atom, was a gentle, quiet, lean humanist. The Manhattan Engineering District included nine universities and laboratories throughout the United States. The researchers' self-imposed secrecy often made inter-laboratory communication difficult and awkward. So Oppie, as the scientific leader was known, together with others, approached Groves, now a brigadier general. They advised him that a new laboratory was needed where people and equipment could be brought together for a more productive exchange of information and ideas. The search for a suitable location began. The area should have a climate suitable for year-round outdoor work. It should be far inland, remote from all sea coasts, to reduce the possibility of attack 
It should be sparsely populated for safety and security, but it should be accessible by road and railway. The land would have to be easily acquired and should have some housing and utilities available. Groves also wanted an area desirable enough to keep, quote, a bunch of prima donnas happy. Oppie, an outdoor enthusiast, had backpacked in New Mexico and knew of the picturesque Pajarito Plateau, which fit all the requirements. A handful of farmers and a boys' ranch school were all that occupied the mesa. The ranch school had been a dream come true for a man named Ashley Pond, an exclusive school designed for sickly boys of wealthy parents, boys like himself. The students wore uniforms with short pants and slept outdoors on screened porches year round. At 6.30 each morning, they gathered for exercises. Each boy had chores to do as well as classes to attend. There was also time for fun. Two strangers with government credentials visited the ranch school in November 1942. That visit marked the end of Ashley Pond's dream. Headmaster A.J. Connell received a letter soon after the visit from Secretary of War Henry Stimson. It said that the war effort required appropriation of the plateau. Classes were accelerated, compressing a year's work into six months. The final class of the Los Alamos Ranch School graduated hurriedly in February 1943. Native Spanish people from the surrounding valleys had farmed the mesas and grazed their livestock there for the last 300 years. For centuries more, Indians of the nearby pueblos had been hunting in this area and revisiting the ancient shrines of their ancestors. Yet these people proudly and willingly relinquished their access to this land for the sake of the war and for the sake of their sons fighting in it. The serenity of the Pajarito Plateau was suddenly shattered by the sounds of a rising war factory. Construction commenced everywhere. Bulldozers tore at the volcanic rock that had lain undisturbed for 25,000 years. Materials were laboriously hauled up the narrow cliff-hanging paths that served as roads. Buildings rose. Dwellings. Laboratories. Meeting places so a semblance of normal life might continue. Scientists began arriving from all parts of the United States and England. and disappeared from the world. As Oppenheimer put it, the notion of disappearing into the New Mexico desert for an indeterminate period and under quasi-military auspices disturbed a good many scientists and the families of many more. But almost everyone realized that this was a great undertaking and it might determine the outcome of the war. The first scientists to arrive, the heads of the project, lived in Bathtub Row, a name jealously given to the old ranch school homes, since they were the only buildings with bathtubs. The new barracks-like apartments had walls that were tissue paper thin and furnaces that constantly overheated. Bernice Broad, one of the original residents of the project, said, In our house, an emergency, by common consent, was when the inside wall sizzled when touched by a wet finger. John Manley, associate technical director, viewed the housing this way. They weren't bad houses, except they just kept catching fire. The coal-fired Black Beauty stoves were tricky and as balky as horses, and if they ever lit, they spewed soot everywhere. The danger of fire in the apartments was constant, and there was only one wooden water tank to serve the town. It froze in the winter of 1945, and water had to be hauled in tankers from the valley until spring. 
The potential for fire in the nearby technical area with its chemicals and explosives was even greater. A fire in C Shop, the main machine shop located next to the building where plutonium purification was done, nearly became a disaster. When the last flames died, less than an hour's water supply remained in the tank. The shingled water tower also served as the town landmark. Streets had no names, so all directions were given in relation to the tower. In addition to problems of fire, there was a constant race between available material and available technical skills. Wives were encouraged to work in the tech area. With their varied skills, the civilian women worked alongside the wax in the race to produce the device that would shorten the war. People here were young and energetic. The average age was 25. Los Alamos was such a well-kept military secret that people outside the Manhattan Project didn't even know it existed. Residents were forbidden to use the words Los Alamos. Post Office Box 1663, Santa Fe, New Mexico, was the location listed for all Los Alamosans. Even the birth certificate said, Place of Birth, Box 1663, Sandoval County, Rural. Driver's licenses were similar. No names were listed, only numbers. The scientists were assigned fictitious names when traveling. Enrico Fermi was Eugene Farmer, and Niels Bohr was Nicholas Baker. Arthur Compton, the chairman of the Department of Physics at the University of Chicago, had two names, Mr. Comus for the East and Mr. Comstock for the West. Even items shipped to the project had unusual identification. Sheets, blankets, books, all were stamped used, U-S-E-D. Actually, this stood for United States Engineering District. People worked zealously six days a week and often late into the night. And they played enthusiastically. Frequent parties relieved the tedium within project boundaries. Entrance to the town was through a security gate where people and their belongings were carefully scrutinized. Anyone entering or leaving town had to show a pass, and a pass was hard to come by. My baby is a main gate, can't get on a hill. Oh, my baby is the main gate, can't get on a hill. Oh, he got fairly this morning, and he's waiting there still. All mail was censored, and often outgoing mail was returned to the sender with an enclosed note identifying forbidden passages. A central clearinghouse was set up in Santa Fe to receive incoming scientists and assist with deliveries for the hill. It was here at 109 East Palace Avenue that passes to the hill were obtained. Dorothy McKibben was the civilian in charge of the office. She was the main contact with the outside world and a link with civilization. People and supplies were dispatched daily from her office to the hill. Los Alamos was a unique town. There were no unemployed people, no in-laws, no invalids, no idle rich. No poor, no jails, no sidewalks, no garages, and no paved roads. The roads were not just muddy and bumpy, they were hazardous. High explosives called HE had to be trucked over these roads through the center of town to the outlying technical area named S-Site. Most of the roads were gravel, some very rough. Once when General Grove visited Los Alamos, Kisikowski took him to the S site in his Jeep that had the springs made inoperative by wooden blocks under them. 
Uh, General Groves was rather rotund in shape. <laughs> uh, as a result of that trip, the roads over which H.E. was moved were improved. The already feverish pace of the project accelerated. Tension mounted. Men began disappearing into the desert, to the test site some 200 miles south. The day of reckoning was near. At the Trinity site near Alamogordo, there was one crisis after another. Test equipment malfunctioned repeatedly. Finally, it was hoisted into the tower. Excitement mounted. A terrible electrical storm nearly postponed the detonation of the gadget. and feelings as powerful as the explosion rushed through the exhausted witnesses. What have we done? And I remembered the line from the Bhagavad Gita. I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. And I remembered that Sanskrit line. Most of the scientists packed their bags and went home to resume their lives and to evaluate individually the significance of the force they had unleashed. A few, like Dr. Norris Bradbury, stayed on in the belief that the real job was not finished. I feel that the bear which we have caught by the tail is so formidable that there is a strong obligation upon us to find out how to let him go or to hang on. Now I claim that the project must also begin to worry about a program of research leading to the peacetime application of nuclear energy. Atomic scientists had come from all over the world to build a device that would end a war, and it worked. Some left when the job was done, but others stayed on to dig deeper into the structure of the universe. The results of this early mixture of patriotism and genius ended a war but started a scientific revolution. A revolution that has brought us incredible medical advances. New sources of energy. And a host of other developments that may someday carry us to the stars.